Today we're gonna to kinda of do a compare and contrast between this and this. Which one do you think's better and why? Comment below before even watching the video. What's the matter? Oh. How is anyone supposed to manage these cables? Yeah, modern PCs feature a lot of fans, RGB components, and daisy chaining cables and connections everywhere, and it's made things really difficult to manage and keep together, which is why Corsair IQ Link has something completely new coming. Dude. So inevitably, every single time I do a water-cooled build of some sort, there's a lot of comments of folks that are like, just get an AIO, it does the same thing, water is water. And you know what, in terms of science, you're right, water is water. But I thought what we'd do today is a little bit of an educational video where we kind of talk about each component that is ex exists within this, and then the open loop custom water cooling counterparts, why you might consider going this route versus this route. So there's nothing wrong with this route. It's just there is a quality difference. Obviously there is a huge price difference. Uh, and these are some things that you need to consider before you move forward and just say, I'll just get an AIO. Because at the end, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with an AIO. As long as it's an AIO sized appropriately for your CPU needs to be able to keep it nice and cool. And guess what? With 13900Ks and your 7950Xs and your 7900Xs and your X3Ds being as hot as they are now, this has never mattered more than ever. So let's go ahead and sort of break it down. Each component that exists inside of an AIO also has its individual counterpart piece that you have to buy when you do a custom loop. So first and foremost, there's a radiator. The radiator's job is to take the hot fluid going through it, transfer the heat to the fins that are in the rad, and then the fan's job is to blow air through that rad to transfer that heat away from it. That's why it's called a heat exchanger, technically. A radiator would be true if it had no fans, in my opinion, because then it's just radiating the heat, although it's still doing that. We're exchanging the heat by using fans, so it's more of an active cooling rather than just a convection slash radiation. So, a little side note there. Your fans are responsible for moving heat away from the exchanger as this is resp responsible for absorbing the heat to be exchanged. You have your fittings. You have to have a way to have the tubing attached to the radiator. That tubing is nothing but a transfer device to take coolant from one component to another, to another, to another in return, et cetera, et cetera. So you have your fittings, which are designed to hold your tubing. You've got the tubing itself, which can be a bunch of different materials with open water loops. Now, what makes it interesting here when it comes to AIO is nearly every AIO in the market, and I say nearly because not every single one is this way, has a, co a combination pump slash cold plate that is a single unit that itself mounts to the CPU or technically the GPU, depending on what the application is now. But 99% of the time when we have people asking me about open loop versus closed loop, and this is referred to as a closed loop because you can't service it, there's very few uh, designs out there that allow you to be able to open it up take the coolant out, exchange the coolant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they're referred to as closed loops, where open loop, on the other hand, is something you have to buy individually and assemble. So these are pretty much non-serviceable. There are some exceptions on the market where you might find a fitting up in the radiator or something. Those are very few and far between. But also too, one of the reasons why you find pretty much every AIO on the market having the pump built into the cold plate slash water block is because a lot of these are just Asetek uh, rebrands. And what I mean, what I mean by rebrand, Asetek owns the patent and the design patent for this. Now there are very few ways to get around that patent and they're kind of expensive when you try. So what, one of the ways that people have gotten around it in the past, or at least tried, is they'll put an inline pump in the tube somewhere where it'll be like a little square and that's the pump and it's got the wire coming off of it. And that's designed to move fluid, uh, through the system. Other brands, I think NZXT did this. They'll put the pump in the center of the radiator where it's then the pump's responsibility to move fluid through the radiator. The problem is those tend to be a water bleeding nightmare because almost always your radiator is at the top and then it gives it a very narrow area to try and pull fluid through. Uh, pump burnout was kind of a problem. That's sort of one of the reasons why they moved away from that design, but it was a nice attempt. The other thing we're gonna talk about here is the materials used. Almost every single AIO on the market these days, especially Asetek rebrands are using aluminum radiators. Aluminum end tanks, aluminum rows, and the reason for that is cost. Aluminum is cheap, or aluminum, depending on where you are. Just added mooninium in there if you are not from the US. Uh, aluminum's cheap. 
Copper has a, copper and brass, and almost every copper radiator, by the way, you'll see it advertised as copper or full copper. The difference there is, and this is kind of an example right here of a full copper rad. You have copper fins, copper rows, and the rows are just the, the actual like tubes that are inside that are referred to as radiator rows, and copper end tanks. Sometimes you'll find aluminum rows, aluminum fins, and brass end tanks. And now brass is also a very low um, corrosive metal. It handles different kinds of fluids very well. It also handles mixed metals very well, which is why you find a lot of brass inside of uh, older homes and stuff when it comes to like their piping system for their water. Copper is where people are going these days because copper doesn't really tend to uh, corrode as easily. Um, the problem is copper is a lot more expensive than aluminum. So that's why you find them going with aluminum in these AIOs and you'll be very hard pressed to find an aluminum radiator in an open loop. Because the reason is one rad, depending on the brand you go with, can cost as much as an entire AIO. So the other thing is gonna be the CPU block design itself. This metal piece right here, which mine's very discolored because of the fact that we use this with liquid metal. So the liquid metal is actually kind of like completely gotten stuck and stained to the copper right there. Actually, it sort of started to corrode it, to be honest, because uh, liquid metal is very corrosive. Um, the cold plate design. This is the thing touching the thing you're trying to cool. The actual responsibility of how much heat can, it can absorb is due to its overall design. So a thinner piece of metal, an overall less amount of mass means less thermal mass that it's able to absorb. So having a thin piece of metal will transfer heat very quickly, but it will also become saturated very quickly. So that's why we have other blocks we're gonna look at here in comparison, including my J2 Sense block, if you guys are wondering. The reason why I'm including this one is I've had, a, uh, there's been a lot of comments in the past about saying this is just a reused cold plate from an AIO. Um, it's actually not, and we'll, we'll kind of compare the differences here. But I've got an EK block on here as well, uh, a Velocity block, not a Velocity 2 block, just to show some of the overall design differences. The first thing I need to do is sacrifice this AIO. And by sacrifice, I mean I've got to open it up and get the coolant out because of the fact that um, this, is, this is definitely an obsolete design by this, by this point. The overall size of it is not big enough to cover... Um, LGA 1700, so they've got bigger cold plates now. You can even see on, on mine, it's, a, it's quite a bit bigger in terms of the actual surface area before you get to the, to the screws right there. So this design right now is just, it doesn't cut it very well with the larger CPU types. Okay, so here's the old uh, Celsius cooler completely deconstructed. You can see this particular cooler though is a little bit unique to the market because it was advertised as expandable. We even did a video expanding one of these way back when. Uh, it's a challenge to expand it, and then you've definitely got to be con concerned with mixed metals. Yes, this is an aluminum radiator. You can tell by looking at the fittings here, even like the threads, because it is all aluminum construction, where if you look at like a very similar looking radiator next to it, you can see that that one's clearly either copper or brass. Now this is advertised as a full copper rad, so I believe, although it looks a little more yellow than orange like copper, so it's probably a brass end tank. Um, anyway, brass and copper are way more anti-corrosive than aluminum is. However, is the, if the brand gets it right, because we do have a, I unscrewed it. We do have a copper cold plate here, as you can see. So we have a mixed metal. But as long as the brand is using an appropriate anti-corrosive fluid designed for whatever grade of copper this is and whatever grade aluminum this is, because that's the other part of the equation is the fact that there are grades of metal and alloys, alloy, they might have other things in them. None of these full copper rads are 100% copper. They all have zinc and other things in them. That's what percentage. That matters. So that's why you've probably seen some AIO discussions in the past of ones that have corroded very shortly. Uh, the reason for that corrosion is the coolant was probably just an off-the-shelf one they threw in there and it was not one that was appropriate for the mixed metal. So this is the cold plate. You'll notice some scratches on there because one of these screws right there uh, did not want to come out. So I had to dremel a groove in it because it rounded out my, the Phillips. But I'm never using this again, so it's fine. But what I want to show you here was actually the thickness of it. And there is a plastic piece on here I need to pop off. But effectively what this is, is this. The water block, technically. It's, it is the part touching the metal of your IHS on your CPU. And it's responsible for transferring the heat. This is like pretty important in terms of the build quality of that. So there's that. This on top of it is the pump. And you can see right here how if we account for the thinness of this, the flow, the coolant has to flow through this. So check out the, first of all, the inlet size. It's very small versus something like, say, G quarter threads on an EK water block. 
right? Or G quarter is the standard, by the way, or the G quarter threads on the JC Sense Corsair Edition water block, the, the XC8. So this is just a rubber piece, okay? And then this just fits over that. So coolant goes in those little holes, gets distributed along that strip, and then that strip, as you can see, goes along this groove right here, and then the fluid goes either way, like 180 or 90 degrees out each way through these, these fins, and then out and back through the other hole on this guy. So it's very restrictive. All of that takes place in that amount of space. Literally the height that we have on those fins is the only flow that we have uh, for the coolant. So there's that, which is adequate for older CPUs. I didn't use a ton of power. Like let's say even Intel CPUs are up to like 250 watts. These new ones now that are pulling 300 plus, no problem, really starts to stress these particular designs. All right, so here's the pump. And you can see these guys here. These are just for show. They're attached to this top piece. Um, this particular AIO also had the wire going through the tube, which is nice because it would hide. That's what this is all about right here. This is the actual tube. So that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of length of, of cable, by the way, for, for this, if you stretch it out. We're gonna hang on to this. This is useful still somehow. Reminds me of an old telephone cord. This is the diameter of the tubing. So as you can see, it's only, what, quarter inch or so? It's about a quarter inch. Very flexible though. So this is what's important. Um, and then it had a protective sheathing on the outside of it, as you can see. And that actually was an anti-kink, is what that's designed for. And then it had the sleeving over top of it. So although it looks super thick, like you had a ton of flow, in terms of like inner diameter, not a lot. But you'll find just about every single AIO is about a quarter inch inner diameter. So there's that. So as I further tear it down, there's like the ring. This is the top cover for the motor. That's the actual motor for the impeller and the impeller is built in like this. This is the pump. I just wished I could have seen the impeller. And again, I know this might sound like Jay's bashing on AIOs. We have systems here that are running on AIOs. All of our test benches are running on AIOs. They're convenient. It's just what you get, a, what the trade off you're going to have here is build quality, longevity at the sacrifice of cost. So let's move forward. The radiator is easy to start with. We already showed this. If you compare, the weight of the copper one is definitely more. You can get these in various colors. You can get them in different fin densities. The more fins, the more heat capacity it can hold and, and transfer and uh, exchange. The downside is more noise. More fins mean more back pressure. More pressure means more fan RPM and pressure, which means more, more noise. One thing I wanna show, um, we'll do this with a close-up shot, is this radiator right here is at least six years old, maybe seven years old. There is zero corrosion inside this rad. If you look down inside here, you can see that it's very clean. It's very silvery looking. Uh, you can see cleanly down into the rows. There is nothing obstructing or blocking it. So it's, a, it's an example of what happens when a company uses the proper fluid design for the, or the metals that are in their loop. That's important. It's just like you have to do when you choose your fluid. The 7900 XTX Red Devil graphics card from PowerColor features triple 100 millimeter fans with ring fan blades, eight heat pipes with direct contact copper cold plate, dual BIOS, and real-time digital monitoring to guarantee optimum cooling efficiency. The 7900 XTX Red Devil also includes removable magnetic backplate with several optional backplate designs to choose from, allowing users to custom tailor their GPU to match the look and feel of their systems without the need for any tools. To see the full list of features of the PowerColor 7900 XTX Red Devil, follow the link in the description below. All right, so next let's go, let's move on to pumps. This little guy right here obviously doesn't hold a candle to this guy. <laughs> um, this guy is also extremely expensive, like 300 and something bucks. This bottom portion right here is actually the pump. It is what, it contains a D5 inside there. You can even see on the bottom that it is uh, speed adjustable. It's a manual adjustable. This is not a PWM pump. I personally don't like PWM pumps just because of the fact that I can't control the speed when I'm trying to fill and bleed a system. When I'm trying to fill a system, I want to fill it at maximum speed. When I'm trying to move air bubbles out of it to bleed it, I like to vary that speed up and down, up and down, because that, that motion of high pressure, low pressure going back and forth helps jostle bubbles loose and get them moving. PWM doesn't do that. And some PWM pumps like to go, oh, I don't see a PWM circuit because you don't run the system while you're bleeding it. Some PWM pumps go, I don't see a signal, so we're gonna run it low speed. So I use manual pumps when possible, uh, but you can get them in D5, DDC, all kinds of different variations of, of pump. This is just one combo that I decided to show you. This is what came out of my original Black Ice build. Um, I really like having a large reservoir 
that because you might notice in the AIO, there's no reservoir at all. That's why there's always going to be a little bit of air in the loop and some sloshing around because there's nowhere for air to go to create uh, the loop being able to be completely filled with fluid. And by loop, I mean everything connected to this. Air up here is okay. Air down in here is not okay. But anyway, uh, a nice large volume of, of reservoir feeding your pump when you're filling it makes pump, pump filling and res filling and loop filling so much more fulfilling. So anyway, there's that. You can get the pumps standalone and then you just have to plumb them into your reservoir, et cetera, et cetera. You can size it to your needs. That one's a bit overkill. Could you imagine this little guy trying to send fluid through a GPU block, two radiators, the CPU block, and then the tubing resistance, and then all the bends in the tube? Here's an example of a non-sleeved EK. No, this is XSPC. I take that back. EK is the one notorious for not sleeving stuff. But it's got a clear top. It's also a manual D5, as you can see, the Lane D uh, D5 pump. This is just the housing that's in, so you'd mount that on something, and then you have your different fittings allowing tubing to go where it needs to go. The reason why I'm showing you this one is it's clear. You can see, if you compare, the impeller is that round piece in the middle. The inlet is the center. It goes into the center of the impeller that's spinning through magnetism and it's centrifugal force sending the fluid off in the direction it needs to go. That impeller is larger than the entire motor attached to an AIO because this is the motor on this side, <laughs> this guy right here. So, yeah. A little bit of you versus the uh, guy who doesn't have to worry about. Yep. So anyway, there. Th this is an example of why pumps cost as much as they do. There's a lot of people that complain about the cost of the motor and the pump. The pump is pretty important in your system, and it's definitely you don't want to you don't want to be cheap and just cheap out on any part of an AI of, a, of an open loop, in my opinion. But the pump is extremely important. Don't scrimp on it. Okay, let's talk fittings real quick, just because this one is one that confuses a lot of people. Pretty much every component is G quarter thread. This one happens to be usable um, or removable. You have a ton of different fittings you can choose from. You've got your XS or your Bits Power. This one's actually Corsair. Bits Power is like the ODM for Corsair. Corsair, then you got your big old one from EK Water Blocks. You've got a ton of different types of connectors that you can use. Like that's just puts two uh, males or females together to, to create a weird, I had to use this to use some spacing, which is interesting in my build. You've got your compression fittings, you've got your barb fittings, you've got your soft tubing, hard tubing. So the fittings that, this, the fittings is literally the part that confuses people the most because you have to make sure inner diameter and outer diameter match. You've gotta make sure you've got as many fittings as you need based on your loop, whether you're deciding to bend a tube or use soft tube or use a 90 degree or a double 90 or a double swivel 90 or a swivel 45. That's the part that I guarantee just about anyone that's ever attempted their first water cooling loop has went, dang, I need this fitting or I'm short this many fittings, etc. Back when I first started doing water cooling videos on YouTube, G quarter thread by quarter inch, three eighths, half soft tubing was it. Then you had your outer diameter. Was it a two mil thick wall or a three mil thick wall? But now you've got 13 mil rigid tubing, 12 mil rigid tubing, 13 mil rigid tubing, 14 mil, 16 mil. How thick is the, the wall? You've got 12 by 10. You've got 10 by 13. You've got 10 by 14, 10 by 16. So the inner diameter on rigid doesn't matter, but it certainly does on a barb fitting. I feel like I need to do another ultimate fittings guide. All right, let's talk about the CPU block. There's our cold plate from our Asetek AIO. Let's start with the J's two cents cold plate. So block teardown is an important aspect to consider because here's the thing, your loop can last many generations of your build. The reason why taking it apart is an issue is because if you use it for years and years, eventually you gotta take it apart and clean it. No matter how clean your fluid is, at some point, you might have something build up in there. So if you're getting a little peek as to how the sausage is made here, the top piece here is just aesthetic, right? This has got giant, um, translucent plastic piece. Here's the RGB. So another thing I wanna point out too is not just the overall size, but look at the height of the fins. So you've got depth in there for there to be plenty of uh, space for flow to be less restrictive. Not to mention the height inside here. This is, this is fairly thick to allow fluid to move around there a lot easier. Um, EK block is also very, very similar. We'll take this one apart in a sec. Um, but I just wanted to weigh these so you can see the difference in weight. 30.1 grams. 77.5. For those wondering, the J2 Sense Edition is a cosmetic change. XC8 is pretty much the same. 
So if you don't want the Jason Smith logo on there, perfectly available in black and silver and all that stuff. So as I take the EK block apart real quick, and don't worry, we're getting to the end of this video here pretty soon. Not, not a whole lot left to talk about. Um, there is a diminishing return. There, it is easy to over spec and over build something and not like if you spend an extra hundred bucks for 2C better performance, that's a pretty bad return on that investment. When you know a hundred dollar block will get the job done, depending on your needs, you might need to go with a higher end block, but you really got to kind of decide if that's something you really truly need. So this is this is the velocity, not the velocity two. This is an EK or a AMD bracket on there, works with AM4 and AM5. This would be perfectly fine for AM5 because AM5 heat spreader will not fit uh, outside of this size of this heat, this cold plate. But when it comes to Intel 1700, they're longer now. So you need to make sure you have it, the appropriate version. When back in the day, it didn't matter. They just, I say back in the day, like it was that long ago, but realistically it didn't matter. It all worked. This is gonna have an extremely dense cold plate on here. Teardown is also fairly simple. It's four screws right here on the bottom of the heat or the cold plate. This one, as you can see, has actually never been used. So how much does this one weigh? 93.2 on that one. So this is also a full copper. It's just nickel plated. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not nickel plating affects the cooling. It really doesn't. The plating is so thin, it doesn't cause any sort of insulation and it is a direct contact with the copper. So it's not a problem, but you can get these in copper as well if you don't want the nickel showing. Um, you can see the flow design here, quite a bit different, right? It comes down through here, it goes through this jet plate, goes down through the fins and then goes around the perimeter and then out that hole right there. So very simple design. If you take it apart upside down, it can all fall off. This is also how you have to change the bracket to Intel if you needed to do that. So tubing, I started to talk about that a minute ago. This is just a couple of different types of acrylic. This is PMMA, which is an acrylic. This is a Corsair tube. Um, it is frosted. This is my new favorite tube lately. You can get a very nice tight 90 degree bend on it, tighter than you can with non-PMMA. It's gotta be a different chemical makeup. We've talked about, about this in the past, but it takes more heat to bend and it bends much tighter without kinking. Um, they've got it frosted black, clear. Here's just a clear piece of acrylic. You also have um, different wall thicknesses. I wanna point this out. They both are 10 millimeter in interior, like inner diameter. But you can see one has a much thinner wall than the other because one is a three millimeter, no, one's a four millimeter wall because the, the frosted is a 14 mil and then the clear is a 13 mil. So as you can see, very different thickness in terms of the, uh, the tubing itself. What does the thinner tube mean? It kinks easier. No, that doesn't mean you're gonna get lucky on your first date. It means that as you go to bend it, it wants to oval and crush. So you have to be very diligent by making sure that you use an inner core as you bend it, otherwise it'll crush, like a mandrel for exhaust pipes and stuff. Um, let's talk about fluid, and then it's basically time to wrap this up with some final conclusions here. You got a lot of premixes on the market now. This is the Mystic Fog from EK, not a sponsor or anything, it's just, we're, this is going in a different build, so I used the Mystic Fog in my personal build. You guys saw it if you haven't seen my, my latest uh, build with the 4090 water-cooled system. So far, it's just like a very, it's like a lighter than non-fat milk kind of a white. It's very foggy, is the only way to put it. I was concerned about whether or not this would fall out and start to get stuck. I've left my system running quite a bit when I'm not in there. So far, I don't see any chunks floating around. I do not have clear blocks, so I cannot see what's happening in the block, but I can tell you, you can start to see what's happening in your loop by noticing changes in the color of your coolant or noticing um, bits and flakes of stuff floating around in your reservoir. So that's why having a nice clear open reservoir is nice to have because you can clearly see, no pun intended. For the most part, you don't need anything other than distilled water with an anti-growth inhibitor and maybe an anti-corrosive additive, additive in there. The nice thing about distilled water, it's deionized. All minerals have been removed from it. Basically the water's been like boiled like you would alcohol to distill it. It's just, it's distilled water. So you don't get alcohol out of it and it makes it as pure as possible. It's the impurities in water that causes the growth and the corrosion, not the, necessarily the, the water itself. It's the stuff in water. If you just use tap water in your loop, you are creating a science experiment. If you didn't put any sort of anti-growth in there, you've created life. Remember that episode of The Simpsons when Lisa created life in her little Petri dish? You're doing that right now. All it took is a couple drops of a biocide to make sure that never happens. The premixes are nice because all that stuff's already in it. 
You don't have to think about it. It's just stay away from the pastels and the opaques and the color thick additive stuff. I'm testing the fog right now. I feel like the fog is a middle ground where they didn't go heavy enough with the suspended material in there to give it the effect to be able to start clogging up. So far I've let the system sit for a long time too and I didn't notice any settling at the bottom of the reservoir, but it can happen. But you can also just get a straight up clear glycol mix um, that is, you can add dye to it if you want, but the clearer the fluid, the better it is in terms of not having things clog up on you, if you will. The downside about using glycol-based coolant is if you use a glycol-based tube like PETG, which is what the G stands for, glycol, if you let your system get really warm and you don't have enough cooling in there to keep your fluid levels, uh, temperature levels down under like say 40 C, you'll start to notice breakdown of your tubing. By that breakdown tends to no show itself in the form of being a bubble at the fitting, like a bulge at the fitting. So if you keep your system nice and cool, tons of rads, you live in a cold environment, your windows open, your coolant temps never go up above like 25, 28, you're probably never gonna see a problem. If you live in India, and it's like 99 degrees in midnight and it's at 88% humidity, you'll probably notice glycol starting to get a little soft on you. You might notice some of your bends starting to relax a little bit. That's a bad sign. So again, the complications. All right, conclusion time on a fairly long video. You can easily get the job done with an AIO. Most AIOs are gonna perform within maybe 5C of a custom loop and sometimes not even that much worse. What you give up is serviceability, accessibility, upgradeability, expandability, at the cost of quality, at the cost of longevity. Because if you get an AIO that lasts longer than two or three years these days, you're lucky. A lot of people start to notice per uh, permeation where you start to see evaporation through the tubing. It can actually evaporate through the tubing. So you'll start to notice your fluid levels over time going down. You might notice your AIO is now making a fish tank percolating sound. Guess what? It's because your coolant is evaporating out of it over time. And the hotter it gets, the faster it happens. In a system like, a, like this, you could just top off your reservoir. The downside is cost. This is gonna cost six, seven times more than an AIO, at least. This guy right here is like $400 by itself. You buy two AIOs for that price. Have one on backup for when you need to change it because someday you're gonna change it. I guarantee you'll have to change your AIO long before you'd ever have to change anything to do with this. The downside is it's your responsibility to make sure it's all compatible, fits, goes together, and you warranty it yourself. With the exception of like a pump failing and dying, there's very little express warranty on this short of like a radiator spins, springs a little pinhole leak or something on there. You're the one responsible for taking care of it, making sure it fits, making sure it works, putting it together and then servicing and maintaining it. And it's a lot more work when something goes wrong with one of the open loops than it is for an AIO because an AIO tends to be unmount your rad, unhook your RGB wires. In this case, it's, it was a single wire. Uh, unhook your pump wire, four bolts on your CPU block, switch it out. You'd be up and running inside of an hour if you had another one sitting there on standby. This is not a video saying AIOs are bad. It's just a video giving you some real information that is not opinion based. It's just facts on quality of parts that you guys can use to make a decision on which one's right for you. You don't need a closed loop. In fact, you don't even need an AIO. All you need is this guy right here. The Blowing Matron 6000.